for the time I can find a room. About 20% um, there's no room available, so I can't promise. But if so, I will send you an email with the exact time and location. Regardless, I will send out by email to you uh, some sample questions which reflect both the form and the level of difficulty of the exam. The exam uh, is 30, three zero multiple choice questions. Everything that I test you on comes from what I lecture on. If I don't lecture on it, I won't test you on it. Uh, it's, it's being given in an old-fashioned way. I'm going to actually hand out the exam sheet. You will bring to class next week two things. A Scantron sheet. I don't care if it's blue or green, but it has to be rectangular. Not, not the size of a... That has to be a, a pretty sharp rectangle, a pretty long rectangle, not the size of a, of a tablet paper or, or, or a printer paper. A rectangular Scantron sheet, blue or green, doesn't matter, and a pencil, if you need mechanical, because you got to take it in pencil. You'll have an hour and 15 minutes to take the exam. It's not designed to take that long. Most of you will finish in about 20 minutes or half an hour. Don't be bothered if that's the case. It's only designed to take that long. But I don't believe that economics should be a race against the clock. So you will have an hour and 15 minutes to take the exam. I know it's a bummer, but I will lecture after the exam. And so um, the exam will start sharply at 7.20. It will end at 8.35. And at 8.40, I will begin lecturing. So also bring whatever you're going to take notes on. Or if you want to record the uh, lecture, bring that with you. So exam first, hour and 15 minutes, and then lecture. I'll send out as a, well, I'll send out an email with all of this, but I'll send out also, uh, as I said, sample questions. I'll send first the questions without the answers, and then later I will send the answers so you can see how you did um, on the sample questions. There'll be eight or ten of them, something like that. Um, the week after next, so two weeks from tonight, the week from tonight's exam, there is no class two weeks from tonight because it's fall break. I don't know if you're aware of this, but GMU is a weird fall break. So there are no classes on Monday. <coughs> Universe is closed on Monday for students. Monday classes meet on Tuesdays. And there, there are no Tuesday classes. So if you have Monday classes, be on campus on Tuesday, but not for this class, because the Tuesday classes two weeks from now are not scheduled because of the fall break. You will get your Scantrons back to you then in, on our next class, which is, will be two weeks after the, the, the time you, you, you take it. Uh, the good news that I mentioned is I'm making, we're making pretty good time in here, and so I think that we'll be able to call it quits a little bit early tonight. Uh, I'm not sure how early, it depends, but what I'm going to do is go without a break so that uh, um, we can be sure, surer to do that. So it's not a binding promise, but it's a kind of sort of uh, uh, happy speculation that we'll be able to get out at least a half an hour. Early. Anybody object to that? You're not going to report me to the provost? No. I'm paid for the entire two hours and 40 minutes, and he's not giving it to me. All right. So we're talking to oh, and everything. I hate this classroom. Everything about this classroom I hate. Except you. <laughs> the microphone doesn't work well. Um, everything that I lectured on from day one. Through what I lecture on today, I reserve the right to test you on for the exam that's coming up a week from tonight. So I'll remind you once again before we leave, and also by email, you have to bring a scan, a, a blank scantron sheet, and uh, a pencil. And by the way, at the end of the exam, 
you will return to me just the Scantron. I don't want the exam itself. Give that to your sorority or fraternity, by the way. Just give me the Scantron. And, and bring, but do, seriously, bring the exam with you to our next class, because the first thing I'll do in the following class is to go over the exam, so you can see what the right answers, what the correct answers are. All right, so we're talking about supply and demand. We're right at the heart of economics, the theory of price. We want to see if um, uh, we economists can explain prices, the prices as we observe them in the real world. I'm still in a kind of abstract part. I'm going to go to a real world example. But let me just refresh your memory with some language about the language and with uh, just some general movements of the supply and demand curves. So once again, do not forget to distinguish between language-wise between changes in quantity demanded compared to changes in demand. A change in quantity demanded is a movement along the demand curve. It's caused only by a change in the price of whatever good we have on the graph. A change in demand is a movement of the curve itself, out or in. And that's caused by a change in one of the six, one or more of the six determinants of demand that we talked about. And there's a parallel language for supply. A change in quantity supplied is a movement along the supply curve. It is caused only by a change in the price of the good. That's on the graph that we're talking about. A change in supply is a movement of the, curve, of the supply curve itself, either in or out. A change in supply is caused by a change in cost of production, as we talked about last week. And a change in cost of production is caused by one of two things, a change in the prices of the inputs that the firm, the producer, has to buy or hire to produce whatever it is that firm produces, and a change in the production technology that the firm uses. So if cost of production fall, supply increases, supply curve goes to the right. If cost of production rise, supply decreases. A change in supply, we'll see this now in some more detail, a change in supply never causes a change in demand, and a change in demand never causes a change in supply. Here's what I mean by that. Let's look first at a change in demand. <coughs> So we start with demand curve D and supply curve S. When demand is there, price is going to be at here, PE1, equilibrium price 1. And the equilibrium quantity is going to be at QE1. And we're going to have demand shift. If this is apples, demand might increase because people come to like apples more. They, maybe, maybe apples and pears are substitute goods for each other and the price of pairs has gone up causing the demand for its substitute one of the substitutes apples to rise whatever the reason the demand for apples goes up that's depicted by a right shift of the demand curve so the demand curve is no longer here it's here but what happens but when that happens the price that earlier was the equilibrium price is now too low at the old equilibrium price, you have to think back to what we talked about last week. At the old equilibrium price, now there's a shortage. At that price now, people want to buy more than they were willing to buy before. But unless the price changes, it's not going to have any impact on how much sellers want to sell. So as the demand increases, this old price now becomes, goes from being an equilibrium price to a price at which there is a shortage. And we saw last week what happens when there's a shortage, price gets bid up. And it gets bid up to the new equilibrium price, to the new place where the supply and demand curves intersect. But now the new demand curve, D prime, and the, the supply curve, which hasn't changed. A change in consumer taste for apples, for example, or a change in the price of pairs 
It's not going to cause the supply of apples to change. It's going to cause the amount of apples that people want to buy, the demand for apples to change. So this should be very intuitive. If for whatever reason, people want to buy more, they like apples better. At any given price, they want to buy more apples. Well, what, what does the market bring about? Yep, it brings about more apples. The new equilibrium quantity is going to be higher than the old equilibrium quantity because the, the new to the end curve intersects the supply curve at a higher equilibrium quantity. So we get a higher quantity and we get a higher equilibrium price. That higher equilibrium quantity should be kind of satisfying because we, in this world, in this example, people now want apples more than they did before. Well, if that's the case, we want the market to supply more apples, and it does. More apples wind up in the hands of consumers when demand increases, causing the price to rise. And the higher price reflects the fact that apples are now valued more highly. If, I'm not, I don't, so you, you can imagine going in the other direction. If demand falls, let's say demand goes from D prime to D. If demand falls, then what used to be the equilibrium price when demand was at D prime, P E two, that at that price there's now a surplus. We saw what happened last week when there's a surplus, price gets bid down. Price gets bid down, it keeps falling until it reaches the point where the new demand curve, in this example, now D, intersects the supply curve. The new equilibrium price is lower than the older equilibrium price. That too should be intuitive, that result. If for whatever reason, people don't like apples as much as they did before, people's demand for apples falls, the lower price reflects that fact. The, the lower price of apples reflects the fact that humanity attaches a lower value to apples now than it did before. And because that's true, we don't want society using as many of its scarce resources as it did before to produce apples. Let's release those resources to produce something else that people want more intensely. People don't want apples as intensely as they did before, and so the new equilibrium quantity falls when demand falls. So the mechanics here again are just, we assume that the price is always going to be where the two curves intersect each other. If you want to see the new price, when the curves change, you just look at where the new intersection occurs, and that's the new price. And you can tell also the new equilibrium quantity. Yeah. When the when the price yes it, uh, well so the price the it, it, it's actually a good question. In this example, here's how to think about this. So let's start here with demand being at D prime and the supply curve is not changing. With me? So that's the equilibrium price. Now demand falls. You, let's say this is your demand for apples. You decide you don't like apples as much as you did before. So at price PE, you're not willing to buy as many apples as you were willing to Price PE, too, you're not willing to buy as many apples as you were willing to buy before your taste changed. So now to get you to buy more apples, the price is going to have to fall. So the way to think about this is we start in equilibrium. The change that we're looking at is a decrease in demand, demand falls. The old equilibrium price is now a surplus at that price. We saw last week and there was a, a surplus, the price gets bid down. As the price gets bid down, that causes quantity supply to, to fall. And on the new demand curve, that now causes quantity demanded to rise, right? 
But the, but but the way to think about it is that the lower price is caused by a decrease in demand. That makes sense. Let's see what happens when supply changes. I'm going to give you. I'm going to put this in a real world context in just a moment. This is just the abstract theory. So here I have supply chain. In the first example, let's do a supply increase. So we start off with supply curve S and demand curve D. So here I'm not going to have demand changing at all. When the supply curve is S and demand curve is D, we have equilibrium price PE1 and equilibrium quantity QE1. Now supply is going to increase because cost of production fell. Maybe it's been some, the invention of some new, some new production technology that makes it less costly for these producers to produce any given quantity of these of this good. Being at any, at any given price, they're willing to supply a larger amount than before. So supply increases. This good has become more abundant than it was before. When supply increases, the only, what used to be the equilibrium price before supply increased is now a price too high. Now at this price we have a surplus. Quantity supply is up here, quantity demand is here. The change in supply doesn't cause the demand curve to shift. As always, you look to where the new, where the, where the curves intersect each other. This is now the supply curve. This supply curve is not here anymore, it's moved out. So the price is going to fall to where they newly intersect. It's going to be a lower price and a higher equilibrium quantity. That should make intuitive sense too. If this good or service becomes more abundant for whatever reason, the lower price reflects that fact. It's like a signal that says this thing is more, more abundant than it was before. So the price is less. There's more of it available. And because it's more abundant, a rather loose hand way to say it is society can afford to produce and consume more of it. And so the new equilibrium quantity that's bought and sold is going to be higher when after the supply increases than it was before the supply increased. The increase in supply, the, sh the rightward shift of the supply curve. That causes the intersection of the two curves to intersect at a lower price. So the new equilibrium price is lower than before, and the new equilibrium quantity is higher than before. We can reverse that, look at a supply decrease. Let's now start with S prime as being the original supply curve, and we're going to have supply decrease caused by a rise in cost of production. Maybe the apple grower has to pay higher wages to his or her workers, have to pay more for shipping crates, whatever the reason. It, 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 the supply of apples, if we assume this is apples, the market for apples, the supply of apples will fall, depicted by a leftward shift of the supply curve for apples. Here was the old supply curve before cost of production rose. Cost of production now rise, cost of supply to fall. Curve shifts to the left. What used to be the equilibrium price is now no longer the equilibrium price. That price is now where the new where the curves intersect. The newly higher or newly to the left supply curve, higher cost supply curve, where it intersects the demand curve. That old equilibrium price, if it stays put, there'd be a shortage. We saw last week that when there's a shortage, the price gets bid up to the new equilibrium price, the new intersection of the two curves. When supply falls, that's another way of saying this good or service has become less abundant, more scarce than before. The higher price reflects that fact. And when it becomes more scarce, Society can't afford 
to produce and consume as much of it as it could before. And so the new equilibrium quantity is lower than before. The mechanics here are very simple. Just look to where the supply and demand curve intercept each other. That's the price that's going to eventually come about. May not come about immediately. Yep. In, in, in this example, a change, yes, a change in supply doesn't cause demand to change. And a change in demand doesn't cause supply to change. A change in one curve doesn't shift the other curve. Yeah. But, uh, supply will not cause this for example, speaker that came in the middle of the stock. Speak up a little bit. For example, like that release like in the middle of the stock, that's like less, less um, supply, which is actually causing no, no, the, 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 there's a demand for some, so when, 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 when something is really scarce, you know, a lot of people want it. They might want it because it's because it, they seem because it's exclusive. But there's always a demand curve for it. I think I see what you're asking. Oops. And don't make so don't make it more difficult for yourself when you have to. So for now, just think of demand as being determined by one, one or more by those six things that I gave you a couple weeks ago. Determinants of demand. Take some preferences. Price of substance goods, price of complementary goods, consumer income, expectations. It's true, of course, that that uh, if, if if a good is advertised and there's some advertising campaign that makes it, that, that, that gives the impression that it's really valuable and scarce, everybody wants it. That, that we, we we would consider that to be a change in taste and preference. The people just they just want it more. They just think it's more. Uh, uh, exclusive than they thought of it as being before. But whatever is the demand, whatever is the demand as shown by a given demand curve, and at least for purposes of principles of economics, which is that actually in this case pretty much descriptive of all of economics, the demand as we define it is not determined by supply. And supply, as we define it, is not determined by demand. Both together determine the price. And the price is what equilibrates the two when the price is allowed to move up and down. So it, with this, there'll always be an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. In the real world, of course, supply and demands are always shifting around. Yeah. What, what? Already went over that. We not here today. Did that? Uh, oh, it took me. I, I, I took more than five minutes to talk about. It. I talked about it for pretty much like a long time. Get it, get it. Okay. So, uh, uh, send me an email. I'm not going to give the lecture again right now. Um. So that's that's kind of the abstract picture. But as I said last week, this makes sense only if we can use it to make better sense of the real world. So let me talk about an example. And it's one that's probably going to be relevant. So as you know, uh, Hurricane Ian uh, is likely to hit. Tampa Bay, Florida, as a Category 4 hurricane. Here's what we know. Whenever natural disasters, such as hurricanes, occur, if you pay any attention to the news, even in your short lifetime, you will recognize what I am about to describe. When a natural disaster hits, um, the prices of lots of goods and services in that area go up. So the prices of bottled water, if, if, if Ian slams into Florida and does a lot of damage, 
Price of bottled water is going to go up. Price of plywood is going to go up. Price of blankets is going to go up. Price of propane gas is going to go up. It's called price gouging. You probably heard the term. Here's what else we know. When that happens, the amount by which the prices go up is determined by how severe the natural disaster is. If it's kind of mild, they don't go up very far. And we also know that as time passes after the natural disaster, prices always go back down to where they were. Not immediately, but they eventually wind up pretty much back where they were. And but more severe the natural disaster, the longer it takes for prices to go back to normal, but they all go back to normal. This reality, no one doubts. So if, 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 if Ian slams into Florida and does a lot of damage in um, a few days, here's what you are likely to hear on the, on the news. If it doesn't happen with Ian, pay attention to the rest of your lives. You'll always hear this when natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, blizzards, strike. There will be complaints about the higher prices, of course. And the news media and pundits and politicians will have an explanation for those higher prices. That explanation is greed. Remember I said that, that the, all theory is a story. The story that most people tell to explain why prices following a natural disaster rise is greed. It's the greed theory. People become more greedy when, when hurricanes hit. That's why the prices go up. That's one theory. I'm going to show you an alternative theory to the greed theory. So the question is, which of these two theories, you might be able to think of another one, but the, the, the greed theory is far and away the most popular one, the most common one. Almost everyone accepts it. Most politicians accept it. Most news reporters accept it. Most opinion writers accept it. I suspect most people on Twitter accept it. <laughs> the question is, is it correct? Or, or how does it stack up to an alternative explanation? I'm sure you that alternative explanation in a minute, but look, before I do that, let me give you, though, uh, 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 at least some of the reasons why I don't like the greed theory. I don't find it very persuasive, but, but I'm, I'm unusual because most people apparently do find it persuasive. One problem with the greed theory, in my view, is that it, it doesn't really explain why people become greedy when natural disasters hit. Why weren't they greedy before, when the sun was shining? And, and we also know that prices always fall back. I've never seen a reporter on the scene saying that altruism has broken out. That people have become less greedy, and that's why prices are falling. If you're going to explain price increases as the result of greed, then you have to explain observed declines in price as the result of selflessness, of other, other regarding motives, of being kinder to people. That's one problem I have with the greed theory. Another problem I have with the greed theory is that uh, it focuses only on the, the merchants who sell the products, which at first seems, seems reasonable, right? It's the merchants who are charging the high prices. But it's the consumers who are paying the high prices. No merchant could charge <coughs> an unusually high price for bottled water or liquid propane if consumers weren't willing to pay those high prices. So if we're going to use the green theory, we have to recognize it's not just the merchants who are greedy, it's also some consumers who are greedy. They're greedily snatching it up at higher prices, making it more costly for you to buy. <coughs> The third biggest problem, well, well, I don't say it's the biggest, but a third problem with the greed theory is that it just relates to the first one. It doesn't explain 
there's no explanation for why it changes. Suppose you're walking along 34th Street one day in Manhattan. It's a bright, beautiful day. You're strolling in Midtown, New York. You're between 5th and 6th Avenue. And you look up, you're by the Empire State Building. And you look up, and you see someone falling. Person died when he or she hit the concrete of Manhattan. Crowd gathers, police arrive, and they obviously want to know what happened. So they arrive, years ago, I would pretend I'm pulling out a writing pad. Now I guess I had to pull out a, an imaginary iPad. The police arrive and they're asking people, you know, did you, did you see what happened? Did you see what happened? And you, let's say you raise your hand. And you say, I know what happened. So obviously all the police will be, but well, tell us what happened. You say, I know exactly why that person died. Tell us, tell us, tell us. You say, gravity. <laughs> gravity. It's true. Right? If it weren't for gravity, that person would still be levitating over Manhattan. We die of starvation, not of trauma. So, in one sense, yes, it's true. Gravity killed the person. That's not the explanation that we're looking for. That's not the explanation that the police want. They want to know what changed. Was it a suicide? Was it an accident? Maybe the person with the window cleaner and slipped? Was it a murder? Someone was pushed? What changed? Gravity's a constant. It doesn't change. We economists, as I said at the very beginning of the course, assume people are self-interested. I don't like the word greed. But if you want to use that word here, I don't really think it's actually appropriate, but you can if you like. We assume people are self-interested. We don't assume that changes. We assume people are always self-interested. Their self-interest doesn't go up or down when natural disasters hit and pass. It's just constant, like gravity. So we want, we're gonna, I'm going to show you another explanation. Here's what happens when natural disasters hit. Again, if I had a classroom that was a proper classroom in which I could actually use the whiteboard and draw something like a proper classroom allows, I would do this on a whiteboard, but it's not a proper classroom. This is not a very good classroom. I don't know if I mentioned that before. So here's what, but I have to do it this way. So here are the original supply and demand curves. S and D. So the supply curve further to the right and the demand curve further to the left. Let's say this is the market for plywood. I use plywood because when Hurricane Katrina, which uh, struck New Orleans when most of you were still in diapers, but you probably heard of it, it was a very severe hurricane. And I'm from New Orleans, so I have family there. And my brother, who was still living in New Orleans at the time. He's kind of a handyman. I remember talking to him after. We couldn't talk right away. He all cell phone services out. I remember talking to my brother, my younger brother afterward, and telling me that uh, before Katrina hit, the price of basic plywood was about $10 a sheet. After Katrina hit, the price of plywood was, he saw it selling from anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks a sheet. That's a really high increase in the price of plywood. Went way up. So I would explain that. Again, greed is one possibility. Home Depot became more greedy. Lowe's became more greedy. Your friendly neighborhood lumber store became more greedy. That's one possibility. Let's compare it to how economists explain it. When natural disasters hit, Two things happen simultaneously. Demand goes up and supply goes down. So let's look at demand first. So this is the original supply curve. This is the original demand curve. 
So this is the original price, ten dollars for a sheet of plywood. The hurricane comes. The demand goes up. Why does demand go up? Well, in the case of hurricanes, people are buying, buying plywood to to <coughs> cover their windows so to reduce the chances that the wind will break the windows. People don't do that. The weather's nice. After the hurricane hits, a lot of homes are destroyed. Dog houses are destroyed. Garages are destroyed. Buildings are destroyed. Some of which are rebuilt with plywood, others of which are patched up with plywood. When Katrina hit, my sister had a, there's a pine, oh, she had evacuated, but a pine tree, uh, she lives on the north shore of Lake Montreal, a pine tree was stabbed right through her roof. And it's in this picture of this house with this pine tree sticking, sticking up through the roof. So the first thing she had to do was, after she got the tree removed, she had to patch up her roof. She had to buy plywood that she wishes she wouldn't have had to buy. Rover's doghouse got destroyed. People were rebuilding the doghouse. People's garages got destroyed. They're rebuilding the garage. And people's homes got completely destroyed. They're rebuilding their homes. So the demand for plywood goes way up. If it weren't for the hurricane, people wouldn't be buying all that plywood. But because the hurricane came, they're going to buy a lot more plywood. So the demand goes up. If nothing happened other than the demand going up, that would have been sufficient to raise the price. So here's the supply curve. If demand goes from here to here, shifts out, then the new equilibrium price is going to be a lot higher. It's going to be higher because demand went up. But at the same time, when demand goes up, when a natural disaster strikes, supply falls. The supply curve also shifts, but to the left. Why does the supply fall? Well, for some reason, it should be pretty obvious. Some inventories get destroyed. The Home Depot is flooded, and so a lot of the plywood becomes waterlogged. It's no longer worthwhile. Supply lines get blocked, so the roads get flooded. The roads get blocked with trees. Bridges get destroyed. You can't get supplies in as regularly as you could before. Some workers who would otherwise be driving delivery trucks or working in sawmills, they don't go to work because as they should be, they're home with their families during such bad times. And really bad natural disasters, some of them are killed. Maybe you can't get fuel for the delivery trucks or to run the factories. Supply goes down. That only further increases the price. So both the increase in demand and the decrease in price build on each other to cause the price to rise. I have a new equilibrium price of fifty dollars for a sheet of plywood, which is not, which is quite quite descriptive of what the immediate state of the plywood market was in and around the city of New Orleans after Katrina struck in 2005. And people look at this and they're upset. They're, they're, of course they're upset. Who wants to pay higher prices? People agree. So here I'm giving, let me remind you of the term, I'm giving a positive explanation. We want to understand why prices rose. I'm not making a value judgment. A positive explanation. Well, why did that happen? So, why did that person die? It's bad. That person's dead. But why? Now we understand why. Was it a murder? Was it a suicide? So now that becomes an important question. Why did the prices rise? This is the economist's explanation. Because demand rose and supply fell at the same time. And when those two things happen at the same time, the result almost invariably is a much higher price. You can explain why it happened. It's purely scientific, detached observation of why we observe these prices. But as I said, as time passes, we observe that it happened in New Orleans after Katrina, it happens after every natural disaster, 
prices go back to pretty much where they were before. We explain that by, well, demand goes back to pretty much where it was before, and supply goes back to pretty much where it was before. Once people repair their garage, their roof, rebuild their gazebo and their doghouse, they don't have to redo it again. Once they patch their roof, they don't need to patch it again. So demand goes back. People are not no longer buying up plywood to put over the windows to stop the hurricane winds from blowing their windows in. As time passes, demand goes back. The houses get rebuilt. The, the extra surge in the need for plywood to rebuild has been satisfied, so it's gone. So demand goes back to where it was before. And so demand falls as time passes after the natural disaster. And supply rises. The roads get cleared. The factories get back to work. <laughs> the delivery trucks get fuel. Workers go back to the jobs. Supply increases. And with demand pretty much falling back to where it was, and supply pretty much rising back to where it was, the old equilibrium price, or something close to it, is reestablished. In this explanation, we don't need to, to assume changes in human motivation. We don't need to assume that, oh, whenever a natural disaster hits, people suddenly get more greedy than before. And then they get less greedy. That's just not realistic. It's much more realistic to assume that people are who they are. And however, however self-interested they were before the natural disaster, they probably had the same degree of self-interested during the natural disaster and after the natural disaster. What changes are the conditions of supply and demand. Natural disaster hits, demand goes up, supply falls, that causes a higher price. Time passes, supply goes back to where it was before, it rises, demand falls to where it was before, it falls. The whole price is really established. Yeah. Um, so, is that the Right. Yeah. So you say, well, so you say, well, they, so you're saying, well, they, 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 they can better exercise their greed. Right. Okay, but still, you know, greed change. You don't have greed changing. Greed's the same amount. So you say, what else changed? What else changed? So you, you might be the greediest merchant in the world. Let's assume you are. Right? You, you, if you couldn't, you'd like to charge a billion dollars for each sheet of plywood you sell. You don't care what other people, you just care about yourself. You want to get as many gold plated jacuzzis for yourself as you can. Right? You just, you, you, unfortunately, you can't force people to buy from you. So you got to sell at $10 a piece. You'd like, to, you'd like to go to work one day and say, I'm going to charge $50 a piece of the plywood. And your customers say, all right, I'll go across the street to Lowe's and buy it for ten dollars. You want to sell me any five hundred? That charge me just ten. You might want to do that, but now we have to understand what enables you to do that. You know that you always wanted to do it. It's a change in supply and demand. It's not a change in group. You don't get a very good explanation by explaining these price changes as a result of greed. And again, if you use that explanation, then you got to say, well, people become less greedy. After the hurricane, that's just not—that's not plausible. It's not what we know about human behavior. I believe, at least, supply and demand—the supply and demand story supplies a more realistic one. It certainly fits the facts of every case we know. This has been studied hugely in the economics literature. As I said, it's not a normative. It's not a value judgment. You can dislike the, the high prices intensely. Right now, we're content to simply explain what we observe. Natural disaster strikes, prices go up, time passes, prices fall. Why, why does that happen? Without any 
Well, getting into it to right or wrong, good or bad. But there are people who look at that fifty dollar price and they say that's just that's just not right. That's just not right. We, we should stop that. After the exam next week, we'll look at what happens when government gets into the business of of preventing prices from moving up or down. And that will give you an even deeper appreciation, or at least understanding of supply and demand. But again, I can understand. You can understand the emotion, right? Wow, plywood is normally selling for fifty off the ten dollars piece now selling for fifty. Something must be wrong with the world. Let's pass a law to stop it. In fact, as I said, those high prices, the practice of charging those is called price gouging. That's not a friendly term. Gouging the consumer. Who likes to be gouged? Who wants to apologize for a gouger? Bad. What economics says, in addition to simply explaining why it happens, economics says, look, that $50 price as unpleasant as it is, and we don't doubt that it's unpleasant. That simply reflects the underlying reality that something really bad is happening. The underlying reality is that a natural disaster, in this case a hurricane, hit a major metropolitan area and inflicted a lot of damage. That's unfortunate. When we all wish that wouldn't have happened, but it did happen. It wasn't caused by the merchants, it wasn't caused by consumers. It was caused, as they still say in the law, by an act of God. Now, natural was that Hurricane, even though it has a name, Katrina, doesn't have a brain. It's not a thing with emotions. The storm hit. The underlying reality that it created was a much greater sudden need for plywood and a much reduced ability to get access to plywood. It destroyed some plywood. It destroyed supply lines. It kept some workers at home. That's the reality. That price, that high price, reflects that reality. It's like a true report of a terrible reality. A lot of bad things happen in the world. But they don't go away if we lie about them. Yeah? Yeah, well, there is. It's called FEMA. And then a whole bunch of other ones. But that's getting way ahead of the story. I want to stick with it. It's not a bad question, but I want to. That would take me too far afield. I guess, but this, this happens. I guarantee you. If Ian inflicts enough damage, if and when it hits Florida in a few days, Prices are going to go up, people are going to complain about them, and people will describe the price rises to green. And the, the pundits will be shaking their heads, saying these people are so greedy. Only they weren't so greedy, the prices wouldn't have risen. E economics is, no, that's not true. Prices did rise because of the greed. Price rose because of the reduced demand, excuse me, the reduced supply and the increased demand happening at the same time. And higher prices reflect the underlying reality. It's an unfortunate reality, but that is the reality. And we don't make it go away by pretending it isn't there. You all heard the story about uh, sh uh, shooting the messenger? It comes in a different, in a variety of different forms, but basically it goes like this. The king is on his throne. He sends his army out to do battle against the enemy neighboring kingdom. And he sends a messenger along with his army. And he's sitting on his throne. He says, messenger, ride out yonder with, with my army and rush back to me with news of what happens on the, on the battlefield. The messenger says, yes, sire. So the messenger goes off. Unfortunately for the king, his army got routed. The messenger comes back, delivers the correct news. Sorry, your highness, your army got routed. Uh, it, 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 was, it was a massive defeat. The king is upset, as he would be. It's not happy news. So he kills the messenger. Off with the messenger's head. And the reason 
we, we say, the reason we ridicule the notion of killing the messenger is because we all understand that if you kill the messenger, you don't change the underlying reality. It's a childish reaction. By killing the messenger, it doesn't change the battle. It doesn't make something create victory on the battlefield. In fact, the king, if he's going to be mature and look out for his own best interest, he wants to know the truth. Let me change this story a little bit. Suppose the king tells the messenger, before he sends it, as he's sending his army out, he tells the messenger, Messenger, I'm sending my army out to do battle against the evil kingdom on the other side of the mountains. I want you to come back to me and uh, tell me what happened on the battlefield. But I don't want bad news. No matter what happens, messenger, tell me that my army won. And the messenger thinks to himself, I'm working for a lunatic king, but okay, he's the king. So the army goes off, the messenger follows, army gets defeated. Messenger comes back and says, uh, Your Highness, I got uh, news about what happened on the battlefield. Yes, messenger, what happened? Oh, we won a great victory, Your Highness, and the king is satisfied. Because that's ridiculous. The underlying reality is that it's bad news. The underlying reality here is bad news. A natural disaster inflicted a lot of damage on a major metropolitan area. That high price simply reflects that bad news. If we didn't charge those high prices, we'll look at what happened when government prohibited price rises later after the exam. But if, if that price is not allowed to rise to $50, that's very much like the messenger not being allowed to tell the truth to the king. Sounds nice, but it doesn't reflect the underlying reality. We'll see there's a lot more problems with that policy. We'll see later other problems with that policy. But one other example about this. Suppose you're a reporter for a newspaper, and uh, there's a fire, and you go to report on the consequences of the fire, and you get to the scene, and you learn from the fire chief that uh, there was a family inside, family of five, and they all died. That's really terrible, tragic news. And you're upset, obviously. And so when you write your report, you write your report for a newspaper, Washington Post. You write, the, uh, there was a fire at a certain location, but unfortunately nobody died. You can write that. You can make people believe it. But it doesn't change the fact that five people died. Sometimes news is bad. And when news is bad, we want to get that news so we can respond appropriately. The high price is news that something bad happened. A hurricane hit. And that high price then prompts people to do things that are appropriate under the circumstance. With, with um, uh, the price going way up, two things happen. The price being at fifty dollars. Consumers of plywood become a lot more careful about how they use it. Uses of plywood that you're willing to do if you can get plywood at ten dollars a piece a sheet, you're not willing to do if you have to pay fifty dollars a sheet for it. So the higher price causes consumers to use this good more carefully, which is good because this thing is now in much lower supply than it was before. So we don't want consumers using it as carelessly as they did earlier. A second thing that happens when the price goes up is that it prompts suppliers to put forward the extra effort to bring more to market. If price had stayed at $10, quantity supply would be here. But by rising to 50, quantity supply is higher. It's difficult to work under these circumstances. Let's say you're a delivery truck driver. I think normally you're driving lumber from, from the lumber mill to the retailers on one route, a very straight route. But now those routes 
are blocked. So you got to take a more a, a longer run. You got to drive way out of your way to get this. It cost you more to do that. More time, more fuel. You're only going to undertake that more costly route if you get paid more to do it. That higher price pays you more to do it. Way before you were born, there was a hurricane that's one of the most stunning hurricanes by economists ever. The hurricane that struck Charleston in 1989, Hurricane Hugo. You didn't Google it. Se September, I think it was September of 89, maybe in late August, but I think it was September of 89. I was living in Charlottesville at the time, I remember. And we actually we got some of the remnants of it in Charlottesville. Um, it hit smack on in Charleston. Did a lot of damage in Charleston. Um, it so happened that at the time, there were a lot of economists at Clemson, which is on the other side of the state, but still in the state of South Carolina, who were very interested in these kinds of problems. And so as soon as the hurricane hit, they went down to Charleston and they did some economic studies. Um, and I, for five years, I after that, from 92 to 97, I was on the economics faculty at Clemson. So I remember talking to my colleagues about what they what they found in these studies, some of many of which were published in one form or another. And uh, one guy, one of my colleagues, uh, told me that uh, he, when he got down to Charleston a day or two after the, after loaded with blankets and propane, bottled water. Canned food, selling these things off their, off their flatbed trucks, selling them at really high prices, equivalent to fifty dollars. And people were booing them, but they were buying stuff. That's the only way you could get it. So we interviewed one of these flatbed truck merchants, and we learned that the guy he was talking to, there in Charleston, South Carolina. A day or two after Hurricane Hugo, very devastatingly hit it. This guy was from St. Louis, Missouri, middle of the country. This guy had owned a flatbed truck and was at home one day, looked at the news. And one thing about hurricanes, of course, you can, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not good, but they do give you some warning, right? They're not like an earthquake. So this guy's watching the news and uh, he realizes that. Charleston's probably going to be devastated by this hurricane. So he's in St. Louis. He gets in his flatbed truck, drives all around the city of St. Louis, buying up plywood, buying up propane, buying up bottled water, buying up blankets, buying up canned goods, loading them all in his flatbed truck. And of course, he's buying in St. Louis at normal prices. Drives through the night. Not, not, according to the story, I got in sleep. He drove. He wanted to get to Charleston as quickly as possible. Drives through the night, halfway across the country, about a thousand miles or more, from St. Louis to Charleston. Stops on the outskirts of Charleston and sets up shop and starts selling all the things he bought at low prices in St. Louis for really high prices in Charleston. Basically selling plywood to the equivalent of $50 a sheet. Whatever people leave, I feel like I'm boring you. Am I boring you? No. Don't worry about that. I'm very sensitive. I'm a sensitive soul. If I'm boring you. Say, you're boring me. I'm going to leave. Be more entertaining. Anyway. So, what's that? Say again. I'm dressing like I dress, but thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, I feel silly dressed otherwise. Anyway, I, actually, I used to I used to teach every day in a, in a coat and tie, but I stopped that about ten years ago. The world got a lot less formal. Um, 
Sometimes they still do it. Anyway, so let's think about this guy in St. Louis. Why did he do what he did? If he was in St. Louis, he didn't have to do what he did. It wouldn't have been a crime for him not to do anything. No one would have held him blameworthy. No one would have said, you bad person. You didn't drive halfway across the country to sell goods to people in Charleston. Well, the vast majority of people in St. Louis didn't do that. Ditto for people in Minneapolis and New Orleans and Denver and Los Angeles. Detroit. Atlanta even. He didn't do any of that. He just stayed home. This guy, and, and he wasn't the only one. There were a handful of other people who did it. He did it. But, it, but, but he was selling at really high prices. People were holding him blameworthy for doing it. But suppose he's in St. Louis. And let's say the voice of God spoke to him, or the voice of the police in Charleston spoke to him, and said, hey, buddy, uh, we'd really like it if you load up your truck in St. Louis with all these goods that we're going to need very soon and drive them to St. Louis, and we'll let you sell them at normal prices, basically the prices that you paid for them. We'll let you do that, but don't you dare sell them at these really high prices. What do you think the guy would have done in St. Louis? He'd have stayed home. He'd have popped another bud. Stay home, express verbally his sympathy for the people in Charleston. The instinct is to not like this guy selling all this stuff off the back of his truck at really high prices. And, and let's let's admit, if he had done it charitably, that would have been genuinely good of him. There were a handful of people who did that, not enough. Because the prices went way up. If this guy would have done that and given it away or sold them at, at no profit, we would applaud that. But he didn't do that. He loaded up his truck and drove to Charleston because he wanted to make a buck, as many as possible. We don't like that motive. Taking advantage of people in need. People shouldn't be allowed to do that. But if he didn't do that, if he weren't allowed to make a profit off of it, he wouldn't have done what he did. Would the world of Charleston have been better off or worse off? if he had stayed home and brought nothing to St. Louis compared to bringing this stuff from St. Louis to Charleston and selling it at a high price. Where is it? Huh? It could be better off. Let's put it this way. Would you rather, would you rather be desperately in need for plywood and be able to buy it for $50 or not be able to buy it for $10? Everybody wants to buy it at a little price. There's no doubt about that. The problem here is $10 plywood is not possible. The demand for plywood is too high. The supply of it is too low. It's simply impossible. So if you want plywood at all, you got to be willing to pay the high price. So that high price prompted this guy... The prospect of selling at high prices prompted this guy in St. Louis and, and other people too to do what he did. Transport stuff that people in Charleston would soon really need desperately from a place where these things were not needed desperately. St. Louis wasn't being hit by a natural disaster in September of 1989. They could spare plywood and propane canned goods, and bottled water. They could spare some of it. And it was transported by the sky to Charleston, where it was in much more desperate demand. He did it for purely self-interested reasons. That's true. But if he were not allowed to profit from doing that, he wouldn't have done it at all. And all that can, all the canned goods, all the propane, all the plywood that he brought from a place where it wasn't in very high demand, that he brought to a place where it was in especially high demand, he only did that because of the problem from doing so. So that's one benefit of the high price. It prompts people to go the extra mile, in this guy's case, an extra few thousand miles, to do what he did, to bring more supplies to the area, to get an area that's in especially dire need of these things. 
It also, as I said, the high prices cause consumers to economize more on the on the good. Here's a true story. In 2003, Hurricane Isabel hit Northern Virginia. It was September of 2003. I own a house in Northern Virginia, in Burke, and uh, it hit on a Friday, I remember that. It wasn't anything like Hugo or Hurricane Katrina, but it did. It killed a handful of people, and it, 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 my, my, my next door neighbor, his, a, a tree fell in his garage and crashed his garage roof in. Uh, the people down the block, I think another tree fell across their driveway. They couldn't get their car out for a few days. It inflicted a fair amount of damage in Northern Virginia. Not devastating, but it was real. Power was out for a few days. So that Saturday morning after the hurricane passed, I went out looking around my yard to see if any if there was any damage. Um, and I was very pleased to see no damage to my house, no tree on my house. It was in pretty good shape. Property seemed to be good. So I was much relieved. I was talking to my neighbor, Bill McDonald, the guy with the tree that crashed through his garage roof. I was talking to him, consoling him about his loss. Fortunately, it wasn't his house, but it was his garage. He had to get it repaired. He had to buy plywood to repair that garage. Talking to him about that. And uh, when I was talking to him, I was in my backyard, talking to him in his backyard, and I saw something glinting on the ground in my yard. And I went over to pick it up. And it was something I didn't know what it was. And my neighbor knows that I'm not very handy. So he said, he said, Boudreau, you don't know what that is, do you? I said, no, I don't. He says, that's your kim that's your chimney cap. I didn't know until that moment I had a chimney cap. I, I, I was a proud owner of a chimney cap. The hurricane did inflict a little damage in my house and blew the chimney cap off the chimney. He said, you got to replace that, you know, because if you don't, you know, squirrels and birds will get to your chimney. And you don't want that. You don't want animals. You don't want critters crawling into your house. So you need a chimney cap to prevent that. But yeah, it's true. I don't want critters crawling into my house. They're built. How much does it cost to to put a chimney cap back on? Say, well, you, you call a handyman or a chimney sweep. They'll put it on. Again, this is 2003. They'll put it on for about 50 bucks. They'll come out 50 bucks. Okay. He says, "You remember to tell me you can put it on yourself." I looked up. The chimney's about 35 feet high. And uh, again, I'm not a handy. The only tool I know how to use with great skill is a corkscrew. So I decided I wasn't going to do it myself. So I was going to call a handyman. Well, and I did. Well, as I walked into the house, then I knew I had an economic experiment to run. This is back in the day, by the way, before cell phones were in in, in as great a use as they are today. I was using a uh, my 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 phone used to be attached to a wall with a wire, it was really primitive, like the Flintstones. And anyway, so I I I, I, I call I, I, I oh and I pulled out something called the Yellow Pages. That was oh, an yeah, old-fashioned book we used to use to to find merchants. So I remember going to the Yellow Pages, finding Andy Man and Chimney Sweeps. And I, I called them. This is Saturday. I got the answers every time I called. And I just was asking them, "Look, I, my name's Don Boudreaux. I live in a certain certain place." How much would you charge to come out to my house within the next 48 hours, you know, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, to replace my chimney cap? It just needs replacing. I forget now the prices like I quoted. None of them were close to $50. They were all super high. Super high. I say, thank you. I'll call you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I called back about a month later. Well, not a very bad hurricane. Same places. How much would you come out? How much would you charge to come out and replace my chimney cap? Fifty bucks, fifty-five bucks, fifty bucks. Price went way back then. Is that? Is that? Is that? Now I could have been angry. Wow, they're charging me a high price. And if I had to, if I was desperate enough, I could have afforded to pay two hundred bucks for someone to replace my chimney cap. It wouldn't change my lifestyle very much. 
But I didn't. And I didn't because I knew prices would fall back to where they were. And it's good that I didn't do that. Those high prices to bring out a skilled, handy person to replace my chimney cap, that's, that's not a very serious piece of damage. What a hurricane is, you don't want workers wasting their time performing modest, unimportant tasks like replacing chimney caps. If I had hired someone to put my chimney, ca chimney cap back on, the time that person would have spent doing that for me is, is time that person could not spend doing a more important task like helping my neighbor rebuild his garage or patch up his garage or helping someone else whose who's, uh, 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 roof was the roof over their child's bedroom was leaking because of the hurricane. When the prices rise, it causes consumers, as it did me in this case, to not gobble up now suddenly much more scarce, valuable resources and waste them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. When supply what? Right. Yep. What what you want? But again, this is why the key come out the difference between changes in supply and changes in quantity supply. Okay? So what happened is the hurricane strikes, supply fell, you got that. This is the old price. You see why that was. Because it, here's, the, here's the original demand curve, the, the pre-hurricane demand curve, and the pre-hurricane supply curve. So this is the pre-hurricane price. Now the hurricane strike. Demand goes out, supply falls. This is the new supply curve. Right? Okay. If the price doesn't change, now this is, that would be the quantity supply. Right? So price now goes up because at this price, now we have a shortage, a severe shortage. Here's the quantity supplied, here's the quantity demanded. A huge shortage. So that's going to cause, that shortage is going to cause the, price, the quantity, the price to rise, causing the quantity demanded to fall. I don't buy, I don't hire someone to put my chimney cap back on. And it prompts people who otherwise, in this case, wouldn't be supplying anything to take the extra effort to bring more quantities to be supplied to the market. That makes sense? It's really important to keep distinction, to keep in mind the distinction between changes in supply and changes in quantity supply. Yep. Say it. So, but, but, but they're not similar at all. A change in supply is the movement of the curve. A change in quantity supply is the movement along the curve, along the supply curve. So, I mean, this graph is too complicated. Well, let me draw another one. So let's say that's the supply of apples. That supply curve is drawn with, 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 with the assumption that there are certain prices that the apple orchard owners have to pay for labor, land, all the other things they use to grow apples. <coughs> If none of that changes, if none of those things that, that you don't have to know this terminology, but the full terminology is, is the production function. If, if the prices of apple orchard workers, the ways we pay the apple orchard workers don't change, if the 
price of insurance doesn't change, the price of land doesn't change, the price of apple seeds don't change. If all that stays the same, then if, if the price of apples rises, that makes it more profitable for the apple grower to grow more apples. That's called, that's called a change in quantity supply. The higher the price, the higher the quantity supply. Okay. So let's say that the, the um, I'm just making these numbers up, let's say that the current at a price of $3 a pound, this apple orchard grower is willing to sell each month 100 pounds of apples. Okay. Now let's assume that uh, the apple orchard owner's costs go up. The, the wages of apple orchard workers rise. So he's got to now pay more to produce this 100 pounds of apples than he did before. So if he's going to continue to produce that 100 pounds of apples, he's going to have to sell them at a higher price. That's true for any quantity. So the price, when the price of inputs goes up, when the cost of production rise, the supply curve shifts to the left. That makes sense? And because now to <clears throat> sell that 100 pounds of apple, because he's got to pay more to produce it, he's got to get a higher price, maybe 350 a pound. So that's a change. In, this is a change in supply, movement of the curve. Again, movement to the left is a reduction in supply caused by an increase in the cost of production. A movement to the right is an increase in supply caused by a decrease in cost of production. A movement along the supply curve is what we call a change in quantity supply. supply. Any answer your question? And there's a parallel for demand. The difference, the difference between changes in demand and changes in in quantity demand. This is one thing that's always true. A change in the price of some good that we are depicting on the supply and demand curve never, ever, ever causes either the demand for that good or the supply of that good to change. The change in the price of that good causes only the quantity demanded and the quantity supply to change. But when demand or supply changes, or both, that will bring about a change in price, which will then cause quantity supply and quantity demand to change. This is pretty well explained in the textbook, by the way, in the chapter on supply and demand. Let me, um, let's look quickly at, uh, I'm trying to think. So I've pretty much gotten through all the material that I'm going to test you on. And it's not even 9 o'clock. Should I jabber on along? Yes. Yes. So let, 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 let so so um, it, everything that I've covered up until here is something that I I oh here's one more thing I, there's one thing I've to say I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that too so another five minutes of new material um, but everything that I talk about today and I'll tell you on the Mac after the and then is stuff. That I can test you on next week. One other, one other bit of new material. Um, the way I describe what happened when the natural disaster struck, uh, the, the way I describe it is simpler. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's the, the natural disaster strikes, then demand goes up and supply falls. So that's true for natural disasters like earthquakes and tsunamis and you can't predict or it's, you know you don't have a long time to predict them. but hurricanes actually are a bit different you know you look at the news oh hurricanes coming in a few in a few days 
as I said a few weeks ago, expectations of the future availability of the good is one of the determinants of the demand. Of demand. If you believe that in the future it's going to be more difficult to get something, your demand for that good rises today. Even though the event that's going to cause it to be more difficult to acquire hasn't yet occurred. I remember 9-11, the actual 9-11, very well. My son was four, he was in preschool uh, in downtown Fairfax. And I was here in Fairfax campus when the news broke. It, 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 so you can imagine, I mean, the world is hugely uncertain. Wow, what's going on? And really, who knows what the future is going to be like? This is a major event, and I don't have to tell you that. Um, and so, I, as a lot of people did, I went to get my young child from school. I picked him up from his preschool. It was a beautiful day, by the way. September 11th, 2001 was a gorgeous day. A perfect early fall day. So I remember driving home and looking at my tank. And uh, did I tell you the story? Yeah. 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 yeah, I thought I did when I was talking about the future of Yeah. So so I, I anticipate I was anticipating, but I wasn't the only one. There was a there was a spike in the price of gasoline in the few days following 9-11. Turns out that oil supplies weren't much disrupted by that. But it was a spike because people like me anticipated that. So when hurricanes are coming, prices actually start to rise before the hurricane comes. And what this upsets a lot of people. They say, well, I, I might understand why when the hurricane hits, uh, prices should rise, but prices shouldn't rise until the hurricane hits. But that's wrong. Once you know, once you have reason to believe that something is going to be more difficult to get in the future, then that something is more valuable today. And so you want the price to reflect that higher value. So prices, don't, it's just a small point, but it's worth making. Prices don't off, if you can anticipate an event, like a hurricane hitting, the prices don't wait to rise. They start to rise before, I guarantee you, Prices at the pump today in and around Tampa, Florida are rising. And there are people complaining about it. There are people blaming it on greed. But it's not greed. It's caused by demand going up. Because people want to top their tanks off today. They want to get gasoline for their genera generators today. Because they're, they, they're anticipating what's going to happen in the future. I oh, yeah. Raise the time. Okay, that's all the new material. I Raise the time. Pretty quickly. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hey, 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 let this lady ask me a question. Can you be quiet, please? I'll let you know when I'm done. Okay, let me start. For a while. The green theory. When people are trying to explain the changing in, changes in prices, there's no explanation for why we change. Right? So hurricane hits, prices rise. So it's caused by greed. I would want to ask, well, why did greed go up when the hurricane hit? And that's what I'm saying. That make sense? All right, I'm done. Is it a man? 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 Is it a